Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Harim Jafar. I am periodontist. Today I will continue my lecture on the predisposing factors that affect in the periodontal disease. Please subscribe to my channel, HL Talent, to get more videos on the subject. So, uh, we talked about the iatrogenic factors. Uh, now we are talking about the malocclusion and the other factors. So in case of malocclusion, irregular alignment of teeth are found in cases of malocclusion, uh, which make a plug uh, control more difficult than the normal person. And there is many studies uh, where there is a positive correlation between crowding and periodontal diseases. So we have many effects. Uh, for example, malocclusion favors the biofilm aggregation and inaccessibility of being removed properly. And also in cases of buccal and lingual root prominence, high frenal attachment and short attached gingiva frequently exhibit recession. And also there, is, there will be a marginal and papillary gingivitis in cases of an anterior open bite or in cases of, of mouth breathers because we know that tang tangothrustine is an important contributing factor in tooth migration and the development of an anterior open bite. So these are with the restoration also these factors with the restoration that do not conform uh, to the occlusal pattern of the mouth result in occlusal disharmonies that may cause uh, an excessive occlusal trauma or injury to the supporting periodontal tissue. So these factors will affect uh, the occlusal discrepancies, the root prominences, high frenal attachment, short uh, attached gingiva, uh, the manners of crowding that make make plug uh, removal uh, inaccessible and also uh, mouth breathers are uh, all contributing factor in cases of malocclusion. So let us talk about the periodontal complication associated with the uh, orthodontic therapy. We know that the orthodontic therapy may affect the periodontium by favoring plug retention by directly injuring the gingiva as a result of overextended band and by creating excessive force or unfavorable forces or both of them that uh, will affect the supporting structure of the tooth. So the orthodontic appliances or therapies will affect the plug retention and composition in two ways. They are plug retentive area. Also, they change the bacterial ecology. It doesn't change the number of the bacteria aggregated on the uh, tooth surface. Also, the type of bacteria, from gram positive to more gram negative types. And it's of uh, gingival trauma and alveolar bone height. Uh, we have a mean alveolar bone loss of adolescents underwent 2 year ortho during 5 year observation there will be a 0.1 to 0.5 mm bone loss but the bone loss increase in adult than adolescents and also higher than adults whom periodontal conditions not treated so it's mandatory uh, that uh, for those patients who have an orthodontic appliances to have a period screening during the treatment, before the treatment and after the treatment. Orthodontic bands shouldn't be forcefully placed beyond the level of epithelial attachment because this will lead to future gingival recession. And also tissue response to orthodontic forces. Uh, we know that there will be alveolar bone remodeling during orthodontic appliance uh, exerting forces, but excessive force cause bone periodontal ligament necrosis and also apical root resorption. 
so it's important to avoid excessive force and rapid tooth movement and uh, there will be an elastic uh, that's used to treat diastema may result of severe attachment loss and even tooth loss if it is not placed properly also surgical exposure have a 10% effect on the adjacent teeth of the periodontal attachment so while you're doing surgical exposure of the canine or any impacted tooth that sh that the periodontists need uh, that the orthodontists need to uh, bring it out uh, to the alignment you should be aware of the amount of the gingiva that you are cutting because uh, it will affect the periodontal attachment of the adjacent teeth and also dental gingival fibers are stretched during rotational tooth movement favoring relapse this is one of the most common errors that orthodontists will do during their uh, the process of treatment so to avoid that surgical removal of these fibers in combination with a brief period of retention may reduce the incidence of relapse after orthodontic treatment intended to realign the rotated teeth so it's important to remove the uh, slightly not extensively these dentogingival fibers to avoid the relapse And regarding the extraction of third molar, we should be aware of third molar extraction because most of the times it will result from a vertical defect distal to the second molar. Most often those extracted after the age of 25 years. And also there's another factors that uh, will create uh, or have a role in the development of the lesion in the distal surface of second molar like presence of visible plaque bleeding on probing root resorption in contact with the second and third molar like you see it here for example and uh, inclination of third molar toward the second molar this all will affect uh, the distal surface causing a vertical lesion in the distal surface of the second molar uh, so this is regarding the effect or orthodontic complication that affect the periodontium we have habits and self-inflicted injuries uh, patients may not be aware of their self-inflicted injurious habits that may be important to the initiation and progression of the periodontal disease. Mechanical forms of trauma can stem from improper use of toothbrush, wedging of toothpicks between the teeth, application of fingernail pressure against the gingiva, pizza burns, and etc. Sources of chemical irritation include topical application of, of caustic medications such as aspirin or cocaine, allergic reaction to toothpaste and chewing gums, use of chewing tobacco and concentrated mouth rinse. Accidental and iatrogenic gingival injuries may be caused by a variety of chemical, physical and thermal sources and yet they are generally self-limiting iatrogenic injuries are often acute whereas fastidious injuries tend to be more chronic in nature so we have trauma from oral jewelry uh, for example we have piercing jewelry in the lips or tongue which become more common recently among the teenagers and uh, sometimes uh, despite that there's there will be a pain swelling infection and increased salivary flow other problem will be gingival tissue injury or recession damage to teeth and filling interference with the speech and eating 
scar tissue formation and development of metals. Well, in case of through the brush trauma, the in case of a brushing, you should be aware of that. You have three things. We have we have frequency, we have duration, and we have technique. In cases of frequency, uh, it shouldn't be exceeding by, in my opinion, three times a day. Three times is enough. But regarding the duration, it shouldn't be 30 seconds or one minute. It should be from three to five minutes without exerting too much force, without using abrasive to the brushes. Because the deleterious effect of excessive uh, forceful brushing is uh, accentuated when highly abrasive dental dent phrases are uses are used. So, uh, with excessive tooth brushing and with abrasive dental phrases, uh, the effects will be synergistic and it will uh, amplify the effect on the gingiva. And uh, sometimes uh, it will cause ulceration and erythema in the mouth and the effect may be acute or chronic. Sometimes forceful brushing leave a, a brush bristles between the gingival tissues and making an acute gingival abscess. Also, despite the tooth brushing, the dental flossing should be uh, used uh, in caution with the patient because it will result in laceration of the interdental papilla so it should be used as uh, demonstrated by a specialist in case of chemical irritations as we mentioned before acute gingival inflammation may be caused by chemical irritation resulting from either sensitivity or non-specific tissue injuries but in, in allergic inflammatory states, the gingival change range from simple erythema to painful vesicle formations because patients have sensitivity to these materials like mouthwash, dentifrice, acrylic denture materials. So acute inflammation with ulceration may be produced by the non-specific injurious effect of the chemicals on the gingival tissue. Sometimes using strong mouthwash, topical application of corrosive drugs like aspirin or cocaine, and accidental contacts with the drugs such as phenol or silver nitrate are common examples of uh, the chemicals that cause irritation to gingiva. So these are related to the habits Regarding, regarding the smokeless tobacco, we have two types. We have snuffs and chewing tobacco. Uh, the snuff is a fine cut form of tobacco, available as loosely packed or in small sachets, like you see it here. These are snuffs. And they wrote for you that it affects your health and it's addictive. While chewing, chewing tobacco is more coarse cut and available in form of loose leaves or solid blocks. The, the, the defect here is the nicotine uptake of smokeless tobacco is similar to smoking cigarette in that consumption of 34 gram container of smokeless tobacco is approximately equal to 1.5 packs of cigarette and, uh, and perceived benefits of chewing tobacco are those derived from nicotine including relaxation and reduced anxiety and appetite but the incidence of gingival recession among adolescents who use smokeless tobacco has been reported as 42% compared to 70% among the non-users. And the NHA 
NES three epidemiological studies investigated the adverse effect of smokeless tobacco on production, and they found a double of the incidence of severe periodontitis in those patients. So it can be concluded that the use of smokeless tobacco is associated with at least localized gingival recession, clinical attachment loss, leukoplakia, and possibly enhanced susceptibility to severe periodontitis. Another predisposing factor is radiation therapy. Radiation therapy has, has a cytotoxic effect on both normal cell and malignant cells. The total dose of radiation is generally given in partial incremental dose, and this process named fra fraction, fractionation, the fractionation of the doses. So the fractionation helps minimize the adverse effect of the radiation while maximizing the death rate of the tumor cells. Radiation treatment induces an obliterative enteritis that results in soft tissue ischemia and fibrosis, while irradiated bone becomes hypovascular and hypoxic. Adverse effect of head and neck radiation therapy includes dermatitis and mucositis. And also there's, there will be a muscle fibrosis and trismus. The mucositis typically develops five to seven days after radiation therapy. The severity of mucositis can be reduced by asking the patient to avoid secondary source of irritation such as smoking, alcohol, spicy foods, because these will, uh, these will irritate the mucosa. Use of chlorhexidine mouth rinse may help reduce the mucositis. However, most chlorhexidines that are currently available have a high alcohol content that may act as astringent, which dehydrate the mucosa, thereby intensifying the pain. And also, in cases of radiation therapy, there will be a xerostomia which favors the plug accumulation. Also, it's reported that there's a periodontal attachment loss in cases of radiation. Dental and periodontal infections have the potential to have a severe risk for a patient who have been treated with head and neck radiation. And there will be a risk of uh, a situation which is named osteoradionecrosis for oncology patients and this and this could be minimized by evaluating the oral status and providing dental care and allowing time for tissue repair before the radiation therapy will start as you see it here this this tooth will be extracted within the radiotherapy treatment and uh, to form an osteoradionecrosis. Osteo is the bone, radio is radiotherapy. Necrosis is the dead of that part of bone. So it should be assessed before any treatment. So at the end, this was the